Oh, good evening, everyone. Can I just get a quick uh, sound check if someone doesn't mind throwing in the chat whether or not you can hear me? <clears throat> yes, perfect. Uh, thank you, guys. That's perfect. Uh, welcome along. So um, here we are. So we're here for another uh, another. Uh, weekly webinar it's our new slot of, of wednesday evening half past seven that seems to be working a bit better for our schedules so um thanks for coming along good to see uh, a good few of you out again um we're here this evening for a pediatric assessment uh, which is our free weekly uh, webinar topic this week um those of you that joined us last week will uh, will know that um we did a patient assessment in general last week and this is just a feed on of, of some of the differences between adults and pediatric assessment techniques that we can use now, uh, the purpose of these webinars, if you are new to them, is um, to help those of you that are going through the FREC pathway, pre predominantly those um, that are going from FREC 3 to FREC 4. Um, but of course, this may be useful for those of you that are at uh, FREC 5 and above uh, that for, for a bit of uh, refresher knowledge, uh, of course, because we don't remember everything we're taught on the course, I'm sure. So especially if you're not dealing with children day to day, hopefully this evening will be, uh, will be a hopeful refresher for you. Um, so um, we are STC Training Solutions, those of you that don't know us, we are a pre-hospital care training provider based in Aylesbury. Uh, we predominantly deal with um, FRET courses, but of course we do first aid and, and, and a whole load of other stuff. Um, predominantly FRET 3 and FRET 4 at the moment, uh, we are just going through our approval for FRET 5, so that is coming uh, in the spring of 22 uh, with uh, everything going well. Um, so do look out for that. If that's something that interests you, then uh, now is a good time to start with your FREC 3 and FREC 4, because uh, you'll feed nicely into the first FREC 5 programme if that's something you, you want to do. Um, so uh, there's some uh, upcoming courses. Uh, I'll just try and get the, uh, the thing to stay on this page. So um, we have um, some courses coming up if you are interested in joining us. So FREC 3, um, the demand for that has been, uh, has been quite high. Um, so FREC3, the next weekend course uh, with Spaces starts on the 20th of November, runs over three weekends, um, and then we have a Monday to Friday option as well. They run monthly. The next one um, is uh, with the Spaces November. There is just one space left on that. I'm sure that will go uh, any time now. Uh, the next one is in December, um, and then, of course, every month next year. Um, FREC 4, um, so we, those of you that are looking at doing your FREC 4, now is a great time to get on. We've got some space. So um, we have the one starting on the 30th of October, running over weekends, which is an ideal way of doing it if you're new to the industry. So you come for a weekend, you then skip a weekend while you do first workbook, come back for another weekend, and then you go away for a couple of weeks while you go and finish your other two workbooks and then come back for your last day. Um, so you can see the dates on the screen there. Um, there is a special offer on, and we'd like to fill that course on the 30th of October. So there is a special offer for that course only if you book um, before the 30th of October, clearly. Um, uh, not only will you um, get uh, the free death scope, we'll give you a free copy of Ambulance Care Practice as well for that 395. So really good value offer there. Uh, and tonight, of course, like last week, there will be a quiz at the end and the winner will get uh, a voucher for 10% off any course of their choosing. So if they choose to book that for four, they'll get the stethoscope and the book and 10% off. Um, if you'd rather do your um, Fret 4 Monday to Friday, those of you with some experience will we'll find um, that absolutely fine. Um, then we have a Monday to Friday course starting on the 22nd of November. Uh, and then again, they're running every month in um, 22 at the moment um, is the plan. So depending on demand, but uh, there are plenty of spaces available next year as well. Uh, one space left on our ILS uh, this Sunday, if anyone wants that, just £95. Um, and uh, safe administration life saving meds again have been massively in demand. So the next course with space now is 15th of January, um, and that has had a lot of interest. So do get on there if you're interested. So um, that's what's coming up. That's enough of the plug. It's just gone half past seven. So um, that's plenty of time for everyone to join us. Um, let's get on with um, tonight's session then. If the computer will let me. There we go. There we go. <laughs> First time lucky. So uh, for those of you that missed any of the series, we've covered CPD requirements, anatomy and physiology. We've covered some pathophysiology, which is the study of disease. We've covered maternity care, patient assessment last week. And here we are this week on pediatric assessments. Uh, this webinar, as 
with all the others is being recorded. Uh, it will be on our YouTube channel um, and on our website uh, within the next 48 hours. So if you missed any of the previous sections, do go back and have a look. The CPD requirements video, um, the requirements have changed since that was filmed, so that's going to be remade. Um, we're going to be talking about sepsis next week, then oxygen and antinox guidelines. We're going to be talking about some ECG basics aimed really at people that are going through their FREC4. Um, if you're interested in learning in, in more, more depth, then we have some free webinars, again, on our website and on YouTube, um, which we recorded last year. Again, we'll be looking to update those with some new content as well in the future. And then we'll be finishing uh, this series with some intermediate life support, a bit of theory. Um, won't replace the need for you to do an annual ILS course, but um, we'll keep you ahead in the game, um, hopefully still. Um, we are uh, taking ideas as well, I will mention. So some people did email after last week. So we are looking for ideas for our next series. Once this one finishes, we've only got a few more weeks to go. Um, probably the ECG session will be split into two. But other than that, we're looking at about um, four or five weeks. So um, do get in touch if you have any ideas for what you want to come up. We want to be a bit more practical with the next uh, the next series if we can. So tonight, what we're going to talk about, primary survey for paediatrics. So we're going to talk about some anatomical differences. We'll talk about the paediatric assessment triangle and tickles. We'll talk about POPs, paediatric observation priority scoring. We'll talk about uh, normal paediatric parameters. So obviously, uh, nobody's expected to memorize those, but it's useful to see the differences in the age ranges. And we're going to talk about uh, just a few, um, or a couple really, of, of, of paediatric emergencies that you need to know for FREC4 um, and, uh, and obviously for real life, because they're, they're useful ones to spot. So we want tonight to be interactive. Um, so do get your smartphones ready. There is a quiz tonight, as I say, the, the, the quiz at the end of the session, uh, the five questions, those, uh, the, the person that wins, and you win by answering uh, the correct answer quickly, um, will get 10% off any course of their choosing. Uh, and that will, of course, include Fred 5, if you want to uh, if you want to use that, and that will be a substantial saving. So um, do put uh, messages in the chat as we go through. I'll listen out for them. Um, tweet us, email us, or text us after the event if you have any questions. Um, recommended reading for tonight, uh, Ambulance Care Essentials and Ambulance Care Practice, depending on which one you have, and JL Calc, good old JL Calc for the guidance. I wouldn't advise buying JLCalc nowadays. It's, it's um, the 2019 printed version is very out of date. So um, get the app if you're looking at getting some JLCalc guidance rather than the book. And Ambulance Care Essentials and Practice we have on sale on our website. So let's get interactive to start with. This isn't part of the, the quiz to win. This is just to uh, wake everyone up. So um, let's go to uh, menti.com on your smartphones and put the number in at the top of the screen there, 3590. 7281. So that's menti.com. Use the code 3590 7281. Answer the question for me. How does the pediatric primary survey differ from an adult primary survey? Evening, Matt. Matt, welcome along, and you are welcome. So get on to menti.com, 3590-7281, and let us know how does paediatric primary survey differ from an adult primary survey? Nobody's having a go yet. There we go. Good, I like that. Tone, appearance, and work of breathing. Paediatric assessment triangle, Pat, very good. Cognitive development, yes, good. So that's an important point, isn't it? Appearance. Different for the child, age ranges, great, different appearances. Consolability, I like it. Excellent. No questions. Yeah, I mean, depends on the age, doesn't it? Absolutely. Just give a couple more seconds for people that want to uh, add anything into that. Questioning. Uh, absolutely. Immunization's up to date, really good, really good. Not probably part of the primary survey, but but definitely something to think about. Prematurity absolutely does affect the respiratory system in particular, doesn't it? Fantastic. Uh, excellent. Yes, some really good answers there. Well done, folks. So let's let's come back. So we all know that the, the purpose of the primary survey is... What is the primary survey? So the differences between paediatric primary survey and adult, absolutely, as you're as you're discussing um, there. But the primary survey, the, the, the main function that is, as we discussed last week, a rapid assessment, a stepwise approach for, for um, assessing our patients. Um, we, we amend slightly for medical versus trauma, and that is exactly the same with children. So good question, Matt, in the in the um, chat there. So 
the differences between medical and trauma. What are the extra C's? If anyone wants to throw that in the in the chat now, what are the two extra C's that we consider with our with our trauma primary survey versus our medical one? Kahem, perfect. Well done, Brian. And one more. C spine. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, Catherine got there as well. Fantastic. Well done, guys. So, so we we amend our primaries. It's no different with children. Children can have catastrophic hemorrhage. Children can have cervical spine injury. So there is no difference really in that aspect of the primary survey. We we want to form this general impression. We want to do this end of bed assessment. Now we have some tools to help us because some of you have picked up in the chat there and on the on the last Mentimeter um, poll that um, there are some communications and some cognitive development differences between children and adults, which is really important to bear in mind. So our end of bed assessment isn't gonna be formed quite so well by questioning. Obviously, it, it does depend on the age of the child because clearly a 12, 13 year old is, is still a child but able to answer questions um, an awful lot better than a two or a three year old, of course. Um, but of course, we still have to form that end of bed assessment. If you remember from last week, we're looking at this term of big sick or little sick which i don't particularly like that term but it is a useful kind of um baseline for you to work from so is the patient time critically unwell or, or can we take our time and, and really delve into a secondary survey here and that is exactly the same with a child okay now what some of you may know those of you that work with children or have done any reading around the subject is actually spotting the sick child can be quite difficult they don't give away that many that many clues that they're going downhill so tonight is all about kind of picking up on those subtle differences but fundamentally the primary survey is the same we still amend it slightly for medical versus trauma and the whole point of our primary survey is to really develop a, a, a a good end of bed or, or general impression of, of our patients. So just to remind you, if you weren't here last week, this is what the primary survey is. So danger and response um, is exactly the same. You know, children can still fall unwell in dangerous situations um, where we might not necessarily be able to go forward. Still got to check response. AVPU is still the way that we check that. Catastrophic hemorrhage and C-spine, as we've mentioned, still appear extra in, in, the, in the trauma version. Children have problems with airway. We're going to go into some anatomical differences in just a second. You know, airway problems in kids are, are, are quite common. Um, breathing difficulties. So children are much more likely to arrest because of respiratory failure than, than cardiac failure. And that's simply because their cardiovascular systems aren't full of beer and kebabs, really. And that's, that's you know, most adults are going to have MIs and, and cardiac arrhythmias and things along those lines because of ischemic heart disease is, is statistically what's more likely to happen to an adult. With a child, they don't have that buildup. They don't have that underlying heart disease. They're much more likely to, to, to um, if they do arrest, if they do become seriously unwell because of a respiratory or hypoxic cause. Um, so circulation, children can have a cardiovascular failure or cardiovascular problems. They tend to be congenital issues. Um, disability, exactly the same as, as, as the adult equivalent, really. We've still got to assess their GCS. Children can still be GCS scored. We still have to look for signs of compression in head injuries. So we still have to look for blown pupils and so on and so forth. Um, we still have to check blood sugars. Children can develop type one diabetes and, and become uh, hypoglycemic. So it's still worthy of, of checking um, blood sugars in the unwell child. Um, and of course, we've got to think about exposure and environment. Children don't control their body temperature as well as adults can. And they certainly can't tolerate cold uh, anywhere near as well as an adult can, so particularly in the, in the young years. So we do have to be alert to to environment and keeping children warm, particularly um, neonates, as we talked about in the in the um, obstetric um, session. Um, and of course, you've just got to think about with the everything else. There's so much more that comes into children, isn't there? I think safeguarding for for a really obvious example, um, thinking about kind of um, the situation, their social history, all that type of stuff has to come into not necessarily the primary survey because E is always prompting you to go into the secondary survey, but there is so much more you think about with kids. So go back to Mentimeter then. Let's just bring uh, Menti back up. So we'll go to the next question there, which is going to be give three anatomical differences each, if you don't mind, between children and adults. So anatomical differences, what's different in the structure of either their airway, their breathing or, or their circulatory system? Give me three differences. Or oh, menti.com, so it's 35907281, 35907281. Yeah, Catherine, you're muted. At the top of the screen there. Excellent. 
Super lovely, narrowed airway, floppy airway, good bone developments, fantastic body weights, heart rates, undeveloped skull, great. Respiratory rates, different. Shorter trachea, fab. Narrows, hypothalamus, yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're, we're worried about um, regulation of core temperature, aren't we, with the underdeveloped hypothalamus? Excellent. Uh, narrowed airway, lovely. In particular, it's a bit of a funnel-shaped airway, isn't it? So once uh, once something goes in, it, um, it tends to wedge itself. Excellent. Um, thermoregulation, brilliant. Short stroke here, smaller organs, absolutely. The work of breathing is different. Also, we spot we spot difficulty breathing dyspnea. We spot that different differently with children, don't we? Excellent. So their brain, their brain's just different. That's good. Absolutely, their brain is is still developing, isn't it? And absorbing things like a sponge. Larger tongue, yeah. So that's good, isn't it? Relative to the rest of the airway anatomy, the tongue is quite large. So they do require airway management, especially when they're unconscious or fitting and things like that. They do they do require help with their airway. Good. Okay, so we're getting some good answers there. I like that. So let's flip back to uh, the slides. So some differences with the airway. So um, with the, the the face is smaller, the compressible uh, floor of the mouth. So underneath the uh, you know between the between the throat and the and the front of the jaw, that space there. If you compress in there too much, you're pushing that comparatively large tongue up to the roof of the mouth and, and potentially back into the hypopharynx. Um, causing airway occlusion. So just be careful with um, this. This all leads to mask sizing because actually these three things here, the smaller face, the compressible floor of the mouth and, and putting pressure, getting that reflex bradycardia when you when you ventilate over the eyes means that using the correct size mask when you're when you're using bag valve mask ventilation, which of course we all should be, um, that we should be picking child sizes if possible. Yes, you can use an adult mask upside down. But what you're going to be doing is ventilating the eyes, ventilating the eyes, as I say, pressure on those on the, um, the, the, the eye sockets themselves can stimulate the vagus nerve and cause reflex, reflex bradycardia. Um, what we don't want to do then is squeeze the underside of the mouth, as I say, try to fit that mask awkwardly and, and push the tongue up. Um, so absolutely, we've, we've got to be careful about ventilation. So obstruction of the airway is a common cause of death in children. Um, we talked about the, the trachea being narrower and shorter and actually funnel shaped in, in comparison to an adult. So when an obstruction does get in there, it tends not to clear down into the right lung as it would with an adult. Um, it tends to sit there and get worse and worse and worse. Now, this is an interesting point. This chest movement doesn't always equal breathing. And that's, and that's that kind of paradoxical movement that we see um, from, from the flexibility of the ribs and the intercostal muscles themselves. And what that basically means is seeing a child have chest rise doesn't necessarily mean that air is actually going in and out. So do be careful to look, listen and feel. Um, the, the way that they, or the, the, their ability to do that, as I say, is all from that flexibility of the rib, mus the, the, the rib cage and the intercostal muscles in between them. Um, that, that allows that listen and feel for breathing and of course strider and wheeze are important noises to listen out for in children so stridor being upper airway obstruction that kind of choking sound or that swelling from anaphylaxis smoke inhalation that type of thing um all the way down to wheeze which is obviously commonly associated with with asthma and airway hyperreactivity um again that's a much lower level generally the, generally speaking the wheeze you can only hear with a, with a stethoscope and the strider you can hear without um of course we all know people with asthma and, and i'm sure in the throes of an asthma attack you can hear their wheeze um quite clearly too so in terms of breathing smaller lungs uh, clearly means a reduced reserve volume so reserve volume just basically meaning the capacity that's not being used at normal kind of tidal rest rates um, the weak accessory muscles, um, because the children are developing, in, you know, particularly prepubescent children, are, are, are have relatively weak accessory muscles. We we talked about those in the respiratory system um, pathophysiology and, and physiology sessions. Um, so the muscles that are used, so the so the normal uh, the normal work of breathing is is dealt with by the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles as as required. If you need a bit of extra extra breath because you're exercising, those accessory muscles around the neck are the ones that we're talking about here. They are they are generally quite weak. So once the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles are are kind of exhausted, there is no there is no backup, and that's a lot of reason why children go into respiratory failure quite readily in in, in the right circumstances. High baseline metabolic rate just basically means they are growing, they are developing, all their organs are, are working very, very hard and they're breaking down sugars and carbohydrates, et cetera, very, very readily. They're using a lot of energy. Um, and of course, that when, when they're unwell, that increases too. So actually, if they're, if they're already using a high level of energy, they're already using a lot of the, that reserve volume that we talked about. 
um, clearly there's not a lot of room for, for, for when they do become unwell, for, for, there's not a huge amount of spare capacity. Um, so actually a really important thing to, to mention is, is the respiratory rate in children, and, and we're going to talk about the paediatric assessment triangle shortly, but the, the in, increased respiratory rate and effort is often the first sign of, of illness in kids. And, um, and, and, that's, and that's something that's very important to actually count the respiratory rates. I know we do get lazy with it sometimes, particularly in adults. We don't, we don't necessarily sit there and count properly. Um, but it is something really important to do in children. It can give you a bit of reassurance or, or, or the opposite. Um, look for abnormal sounds. We talked about strider, grunting wheeze. I've got some videos to show you. Um, recession, recession. Again, I've got a video to show what that looks like, but particularly under five is, is definitely a worrying sign to children under five. If they're getting recession, which is sucking in of the skin around the rib cage. So with each breath in, pressure is decreasing within the thorax, that skin gets sucked in through the intercostal spaces um, and, and it makes the rib cage very visible. I've got a video to show you, but that's something in, in a child under five, we're, we're, sorry, in a child over five, we're, we're definitely more worried about that. The reason the reason is as, as the child ages, their intercostal muscles become less uh, malleable, less flexible. Um, so in a child over five years old, of course, we're, we, are, we are concerned by that. Nasal flaring, I've got a video to show you that. That's where the nose, again, it's a sign of, of difficulty breathing. Um, and accessory muscle use, when they do use it, that causes this kind of head bobbing motion. So you'll see, you'll see that in a couple of the videos coming up um, for, for um, just keeping on top of, or, or looking for subtle signs that, that um, children are struggling with their breathing. And finally, we're going to talk about circulation. So um, just bear in mind the levels of blood we're talking about here. Newborn baby, um, around 240 mil. That's, you know, two thirds of a can of Coke, isn't it? We talked about that in the in the obstetric session, but 80 mil per kilo generally up to puberty, and then it drops to more like 70 mil per kilo in, in the adult population. Um, so uh, again, in, with, with, with the circulatory system in, in, the, in children, because it's kind of working at max anyway, because of the high metabolic rate and all the development that's going on, Generally speaking, the only way they can increase their blood or their cardiac output, more specifically than blood pressure, is by increasing their heart rate. So when, again, early signs of illness come back to raised respiratory rate and raised heart rate. When, when I teach my FRET 3 and FRET 4 courses, I always say the, those early signs, that, that raised respiratory rate, that raised heart rate, is, is a form of shock until proven otherwise realistically. Isn't it? it's, either, it's either hypervolemic shock, it's either distributive shock from a sepsis or an anaphylaxis. You would hope you'd spot the anaphylaxis. Um, or some kind of cardiogenic or neurogenic shock going on in, in the really rare circumstances. But always think of high respiratory rate, high heart rate, shock until proven otherwise. Okay, obviously they've just got off a treadmill, clearly not. Um, so children are able to compensate well for shock though, despite all this kind of bad news I'm giving you. They do look after themselves quite well, but they do tend to go off, what we what we tend to say is they go off a cliff, don't they? They, they look okay, they look okay, and then they don't. Uh, and by the point they don't look okay, actually, it's an uphill battle to try and recover them sometimes, and that's when children can arrest. Um, blood pressure, it's, it's not worth doing really in children, so prepubescent children are, are generally, again, because they, they, sh they look like they're compensating well, their blood pressure tends to stay relatively stable until, until the point when they're not very well, then, and, and actually that's a... That's a, that's a late stage at that point. So bradycardia in children, so a heart rate of less than 60 is, is a serious sign. Now in those younger children, it's part of the resource council guidance, isn't it? So if we see if we see or feel bradycardia, a heart rate less than 60 and, and, and signs of signs of kind of circulatory failure, we're absolutely going to start CPR at that point. So we don't going to wait for for kind of no palpable pulses. Capillary refill time is far more useful than, than blood pressure. Now, capillary refill time is that squeezing of the finger, um, release it and count how many seconds it takes for, for that to go from pale back to pink. Um, it's more useful on, on central areas, actually. So forehead and sternum are quite useful for doing uh, central capillary refill. Um, but that is, as I say, far more useful than blood pressure and, and signs of, of circulatory failure. Um, skin temperature and colour are also useful. You know, you get mottling, you get cooling of the extremities for children. They're often early signs of, of circulatory failure as well. So, again, it could just be that the child is cold from being outside. So you've got to take it into clinical context as well. If observations are deranged, we're seeing a handful of these things going on. Delayed capillary refill, cool, cool extremities in a warm room, you know, and that mottled appearance. Absolutely. Start to be worried. Start to be worried. So here's some videos. Let's see how they're going to play. Because I remember last time we tried to do this, it didn't work too well. So let's just see if this one wants to play. I know 
YouTube does normally work okay. Here we go. So um, this does have sound. Uh, it should be transmitting to you. So um, it might need to turn your speakers up a little bit. So this is a child with a strider. This is just to uh, show you strider. I think this child from memory also has some intercostal recession going on. So do take a look. So that thin spiritual strider there. Then you can see some recession just below the nipples on the left hand side of the child there. Excellent. So uh, the next one. Okay. okay. So we're having fun with PowerPoint tonight, aren't we? Goodness me. All right. I'm sure one of these buttons here will do it. No, apparently not. Right. Oh, we are having fun. Hang on, bear with, bear with. Okay, there we go, it worked. <laughs> right, so the next one is grunting. So uh, this is, um, so in Spiritually Strider, we, we heard there, which was the, um, the, the blockage of an upper airway. The grunting is also generally associated with blockages around the epiglottis, around the top of the, um, the larynx there. So have a listen into this one. It's often a sign of exhaustion and, and you can see that this child looks quite tired. Again, we've got some recession going on there. But that panting is is um, is definitely something to um, to to be concerned by. Uh, here we go. So this is more for uh, intercostal recession. Um, it's, here we go. So he very well may be one of these new uh, enterovirus sixty eight infections. He's never wheezed before, and um, has had a couple of days. Mom, Dad, you were telling here me we we're starting to see some intercostal days, recession just at the side. Three days, and then. When did he really get shorter breath? It will go on from that one because it's not that useful. There were some better ones. Um, this is nasal flaring again with recession. You see that recession occurs in quite a few cases. So you can see the noses there, the nasal um, passages there just being flared out with the breathing. That's what we mean by nasal flaring. There's also a little bit of tracheal tug when the child rolls its head to the side. You can see the trachea is just being pulled up a little bit. Okay, all those are, are good are good things to look out for um, in in when we when we're assessing for difficulty in breathing. So this leads us into the pediatric assessment trial. Why are we interested in worker breathing? Well, this is one of the tools. That we, so I go back to the beginning where I said actually you 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 may not be able to those children we've just seen there. You can't question them. You can't ask them how do you feel. How long have you felt that way for? You can't go into Socrates with them. So, but we have to kind of make some assumptions for ourselves. Obviously, mum and dad, you, you would hope, are going to give you a fairly good history. But actually assessing the child is going to require a lot more of your in, in, interpretation of what's actually going on. And we use the paediatric assessment triangle. So there's three sides to it. So there's appearance, there's work of breathing, and there's circulation to skin. So ABC. This is in addition to the primary survey. This isn't instead of, okay? So um, appearance is, is something called tickles. We're gonna go into tickles in a minute, but that's, that's looking at the tone of the child, okay? How much movement is there? Children should be tonic. They should, they should kind of resist um, pulling and all that type of stuff. Um, they should be wriggling around and moving. That's, children don't normally flop and, and, and look, you know, look unresponsive. Um, levels of interactiveness. We're worried about low levels of interactiveness. Okay, Ch children again, when they see strangers walk into the room, they should follow them, they should interact with them in some way. Um, consolability, uh, again, you know, uh, parents out there will know that sometimes you just can't console your child and actually that's generally the times that they're not that well um and or they injured themselves of course but but not you know mum and dad not being able to console the child is is a little bit of a red flag just to, to have in your mind there so um inability to console is is definitely up there in in terms of appearance things that we're, we're going to be concerned by abnormal looking gaze looks a little bit like interactivity um and and it's kind of basically the child should follow you you know even if they don't want to interact with you they should be following you around the room you know you as a stranger in a green uniform um, should be the highlight of their day, really, for most kids. They're going to be, you know, they're going to be taking loads of interest in what you're doing, even if they don't want to engage with you or they're scared of you. They should be watching. 
So, um, so that not engaging with their eyes is is, is definitely a warning sign. Um, and the abnormal speech and cry again, that tired kind of high pitched cry as as the child's getting exhausted um, or, or not speaking when when they would normally is, is generally something just to use um, just to just to help form that picture. So worker breathing, we just looked at some abnormal sounds, some abnormal uh, retractions and flaring, gasping, um, as it, exactly as it sounds. Apnea just means um, breathing stops. Clearly, you, you want to you want to spot that in your primary survey. Um, abnormal positioning, so that um, that sitting forward and drooling um, thing we're going to see later has has a particular. Um, a particular um, uh, subject that we're, that we're concerned about. And then we're looking at circulation to skin as well. So I've told you about cool extremities, mottling, mottling that looking like corned beef skin um, that you get when you go outside and it's really, really cold. You come back into the warm and your skin's a bit all corned beef looking. Um, cyanosis again is, is a worrying sign in, in children um, and pallor is, is going pale and, and kind of losing circulation. So again, Signs of, of circulatory failure are, are, are relatively hard to see. Capillary refill time is often thought of as being one of the most reliable. Um, but again, it's taking the whole child in, in perspective, isn't it? And using some clinical judgment with that. So two things I want to introduce you to, well, tickles we've talked through anyway, is, is something to remember. Tone, interactivity, consolability, looking and gazing and um, their speech or cry, just kind of assessing them and do they look normal? And actually, if, if all of those are off, we're probably looking at some red flags. So um, it's not big enough probably for, for many of you to read, but this is the nice traffic lights. This is something that we can use to quickly assess children as well. This is again, in addition to your pediatric assessment triangle, nice to come up with this traffic light thing of, of uh, color of the lips, activity, respiratory system, circulatory system, and other things to look out for. In the green, they're probably okay. In the amber, a few of those we want to take, take notice of. Um, and anything in the red, we're generally thinking actually this child could be unwell, they need to be assessed by someone that knows what they're on about. So um, not something to something to read around, particularly if you're looking into doing FREC4 and doing some CPD, familiarise yourself with the nice traffic light um, for febrile illness. It's in jail calc, in the pocketbook and in the big one, and of course online as well. So this brings us into, into POPs, so Paediatric Observation Priority Score. So POPs is effectively like news for children because news obviously is, is from, um, from adult onwards. So um, POPs is something that we use in the ambulance service to try and get a, a score. So, so what we, we like in the ambulance service is, is scores, isn't it? So actually if they're 0 to 1, they're okay. Uh, 2 to 3, mm, you know start paying attention four to seven i think they probably need to be seen and, and eight plus actually they're, they're really unwell um so do we use pews so we don't use pews outside of hospital you know it's um it was found to be um it didn't it didn't apply terribly well in the pre-hospital setting so pops has been the one that the ambulance service chooses but yes there is there is pews out there as well that's something that you can you can definitely look into which was the the, the pediatric version of news effectively but no in, in the pre-hospital setting gave us it, it, it wasn't it wasn't working terribly well and opus used to be used um uh, for sepsis scoring but pops is, is by far the favorite for us now um you can see here that um there's this it's slightly more complex than news and with, with news you get and pews you you get one score for each thing so if we take, for example, this um, other line here. So, so basically what we're looking at here is we're working through their saturations, their breathing, um, their level of response, your gut feeling, your subjective view of what the, of what the child looks like, um, and then any other kind of um, high risk factors. And then we're going to look at their appropriate age. So we're only going to look at one of these four boxes at the bottom in addition to the top. So if, if they're not between naught and one, we're going to we're going to score their um, pulse respiratory rate and temperature based on these three guides guides here. If they're one to two, two to five, five to twelve, we use the respective set of, of boxes. But for every child, we're going to look at these top um, five boxes in any case. Um, now you can score more than once, if that makes sense. Obviously, not not for these these ones at the bottom because you can only have one pulse. But you can score more than once. So if we had, for example, stridor and moderate recession, you would score three. Uh, if, for example, you had an oncology patient uh, who was also a premature baby, you would score three. Or also had congenital heart disease, you would score four. You know exactly, for example. So you you accumulate these totals. You can get to a high pop score quite quite quickly, but I think the pop score anyway, as I say, for the pre-hospital setting works very very well, and and I like the fact that it has this gut feeling because you can walk into some kids and go, you know what, they don't look right. I don't know what's wrong with them, but they don't look right. 
again, if you score anything in red, you, you're going to start taking things seriously. And and the general guidance with POPs is that eight and, eight and above is, is for immediate review, i.e. blue light to hospital query sepsis. Okay, so that comes into uh, normal ranges then. Obviously, POPs helps you with that. POPs is going to help you score. So uh, a one to two year old with a respiratory rate of 25 is, is normal. Um, below 20 is abnormal, above 50 is abnormal, 36 to 50 is kind of mildly deranged. Okay, so that's kind of how we use it. And that and that tally, that tallies. This is what JR Calc say the answer should be. Respiratory rates, um, they start high and they work down as you get closer to puberty and adulthood. Um, and that's just that, that high baseline metabolic rate and the and the low the um the kind of low residual volumes of the lungs. So they are working harder, they're working faster because they're smaller. So um so that's to be expected. These are the ranges. Nobody really memorizes them. If you've got JL Calc, you've got page for age at the back, which will tell you the normal range for the um the age of child you're looking at. And then of course you've got the benefit of being on the right page for any drugs that you want to give if you're if you're suitably trained. Um, as you can see, at, at 12 onwards, um, generally puberty age, we would expect them to be in the normal adult range of 12 to 20. Um, same thing with, with um, children, they hit the normal adult range of, uh, sorry, with heart rates, they hit the normal adult range um, slightly younger at about 10. Um, but again, much higher in the younger children. Now, in, um, in the first few months of life, we, we can get some slowing of the heart at night uh, in deep sleep. That's why that normal range of 85 205 looks a bit out of place. That 85 or, or dropping down to 85 is not uncommon during sleep. Um, but whilst they're awake, they should definitely be closer to that 205 range. Uh, and this is the group of patients that were definitely thinking, uh, you know, certainly up to two years. If they're bradycardic, they're probably peri arrest. So we probably need to start some CPR on these children from two years onwards, um, less so. Okay, obviously you're going to take the, the, the whole picture into, into view there, aren't you? Um, again, nobody's going to remember these numbers, but it's useful to know that children children obviously are going to run a lot higher because their circulatory system is working harder with the lower capacities. So, back to Minty. Let's have a look at the next question. So there we go. Give me three childhood emergency conditions, so if everyone can um, have a list of those. So menti.com 35907281. Three childhood emergency conditions. Meningitis, epiglottitis, croup, lovely. It's handy because that's the three we're going to talk about. Bronchiolitis, that's a good one. Croupé, the French version of croup. I like it. Good. Uh, excellent. Meningitis, everyone thinks of sepsis. Absolutely. We'll talk about that. Great. Diarrhea can be, can't it? It can, it can end up being a bit of a problem when they get dehydrated. Asthma, great. Asthma in children, really prolific. Anaphylaxis can happen in children. Good. Rays, absolutely. Rays syndrome. Slap cheek, yeah, absolutely. Impetigo again, not so much of an, uh, of an emergency, but absolutely. Um, allergy again can become anaphylaxis. Good, good. So meningitis, um, very much the one everyone's going for, which is what we normally think of, isn't it? What we normally panic ourselves about. So um, asthma, of course, kills children. Uh, the last paediatric cardiac arrest I did see that, well, that, that had a good outcome anyway, was, was an asthmatic arrest. Um, so we do have to be alert to, to things like this going on. Um, croup generally isn't an emergency, but we are going to help you decide between croup and epiglottitis, which, of course, is an emergency. Good spot there. Um, diarrhea can make the child dehydrated. Um, uh, bronchiolitis absolutely can make can, can give some real respiratory problems to kids. Okay, fantastic. Well done, guys. Let's get back to um, here. Let's talk meningitis. What is it? It's inflammation of these layers of the brain, isn't it? Or the protective layers of the brain known as the meninges, pia mater, arachnoid mater, and the two layers of dura mater. Um, it's generally the arachnoid mater that becomes inflamed, and actually that bacteria spreads within the um, subarachnoid space, which is the space between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. That's where your cerebrospinal fluid circulates. Um, and of course, it's a perfect breeding ground for bacteria. So the immune response to that area isn't particularly great. Um, and, and it's continuous uh, all around the spinal cord and, and causes loads and loads of issues when, when, um, when the uh, bacteria get in there and start proliferating. So meningitis is inflammation of the meninges. It can be bacterial or viral. Of course, bacterial is the one that makes you kind of toxically unwell and, um, and, and develops into sepsis. And sepsis we're going to talk about next week. 
I won't talk too much about that at the moment, but um, it is absolutely a life-threatening emergency that can kill within hours. I mean, I, I when I teach, I give a couple of examples. I had two very, very similar cases of, of um, suspected meningitis, which turned out to be um, both, you know, young, fit, um, late teens, um, boys, and they um, they both had very, very similar presentations. That's why I kind of hold them in my mind a little bit, because I just think they they, they both presented very similarly and, and we both got to them, you know, late morning and, and both of them were dead by early afternoon or mid afternoon. And you think actually that's that young fit adults in, in the prime of their life, you know, and, and, and many times have killed them. So, so we need to, we do need to be aware that this, this isn't, this isn't something we say is life threatening and don't really mean it. It absolutely is. So, and I'm sure, you know, you don't have to go far to, to find someone that's been touched by a, a meningitis death. So it's, it, it is, it is still, relatively a common common issue so it can affect anyone although it is most common in the youngsters it's most common in two particular groups of of, of children and that's those that's in first year of primary school and and first year of university that tends to be the two spikes in the uk um the reasons behind that are thought to be um social action it's to do with social circles it's to do with how you're um you're kind of uh, exposing yourself to bacteria and and different kind of colonies and things like that outside of your your immediate family and immediate circle of friends that you have so that's that's one of the main reasons behind it they think um but yes yeah, so they're the, the two kind of spikes as we get older our risk of meningitis does decrease as I said, bacterial viral, the viral one is still going to make you very unwell, but it's, it's you know, very unlikely to kill you because it doesn't really turn into sepsis. But the bacterial one absolutely does. Um, and um, bacterial meningitis, as, as I say, needs to be needs to be treated as life threatening. You're not going to know the difference outside of hospital. Again, there are vaccines, but again, no vaccine is 100 percent effective. So um, just because you've been vaccinated doesn't mean you can't get it. Um, signs and symptoms. This is Meningitis Research Foundation and, and Meningitis Now are two charities that I would say if you've got an interest in meningitis, go and have a look at. Um, the signs and symptoms are really vague, aren't they? You know, I, I, I often joke, you know, this is this is most university students anyway. And actually in the first year of university, freshers, things like that. Um, most most um, of them are probably going to have a fair few of these symptoms most mornings. Um, so to try and pick out hangover versus meningitis, or let's be honest, just any other illness versus meningitis can be really, really difficult in those early stages. So it's no wonder that it gets missed. It really isn't. Um, so we just have to always ask the question of, you know, as we'll talk about next week with sepsis, could it be sepsis? Um, we're, we're always going to ask ourselves that question of, actually, could it be meningitis, particularly in those age groups, in, the, in, those, young, in those youngsters? But I think I always say to people, if you're thinking meningitis, you probably need a, you know, a few of these, a few of these symptoms going on for us to really start thinking it is meningitis. And obviously, you know, lumbar puncture is the is the only way of actually diagnosing it fully and and, and blood cultures. Um, but severe headache, fever and vomiting, stiff neck. I mean, those things can occur from any kind of illness, really, can't they? The stiff neck, I know everybody associates with meningitis because the, the meninges continue down through the neck. Um, and that's what's causing the pain. But of course, it, it, it can happen with loads of other illnesses as well, where you get muscle aches and general malaise. Dislike of bright lights, everyone thinks of photophobia as being meningitis. I mean, true, true meningitis does have quite extreme photophobia. Um, but again, if you feel unwell or if you've got a hangover, nobody's going to want them, you know, light shined in their eyes. I'd say confusion, delirium again, as, as with seizures, as with very sleepy, vacant, difficult to wake. Those, those are kind of signs of, of, of an unwell child anyway, whether or not you think it's meningitis, I would be concerned by them. But other than that, other than the rash, which we're going to talk about separately, there's nothing there really that's specific to meningitis. So the rash, the rash is a difficult one because actually it's, it's, only, it's only present in around 40% of cases, generally speaking. Um, and, and it's this non-blanching rash. When you do the tumbler test, you roll the glass over the, over the rash and it doesn't disappear. Um, that's that's the worrying side, but it's actually at a very late stage. So if you're seeing that, it's it's kind of a kind of writing's on the wall. You need to you need to be very very quick and get some antibiotics into that patient very very quickly. Um, so septicemia is the term given to um, this when when the when the meningitis kind of turns into blood poisoning. It's much more known as as just sepsis now. Um, but septicemia back in the day was was what killed you with meningitis, wasn't it? It was always thought of meningitis and septicemia, meningococcal septicemia. It's now generally just thought of as being a sepsis, and actually meningitis is a very good cause of sepsis, as we'll find out next week. Um, a little bit more about why that's the case. But the rash, not a reliable thing. It's only there in less than half of cases and, and actually a late stage. So we're not waiting for that. So 
And here we are, this, this brings into the last little emergency that we do need to be aware of, and that is epiglottitis. Now it's often misdiagnosed as croup, uh, and actually the other way around as well, croup is often misdiagnosed as epiglottitis. So um, funny enough, Charlotte um, saw a case of epiglottitis the other day. It's been a long time since I've seen a genuine case, but of course I'm touching wood because I don't like seeing them. Um, but uh, they they are around. It's this time of year where we're going to get the, um, the the change in seasons, where it's starting to get colder and kids pick up nasty upper respiratory illnesses. So it's, what's the difference? Croup is um, is edema. It's swelling, fluid build up around the voice box, around this larynx here, and and that squeezes the vocal cords and gives them that that hoarse seal bark cough. Um, epiglottitis is a bacterial infection of the epiglottis. Okay. Now with, with croup, swelling around the voice box sounds like it could be a massive problem, but generally isn't. Even in severe croup, there's no there's no formal airway obstruction generally. Uh, they respond very, very well to oral steroids and um, and uh, paracetamol normally, just a bit of cowpole, and, and they do absolutely fine. There's no real emergency with croup generally, unless they have kind of real severe strider and they seem to be really struggling for breath, but that's normally because there's other things going on, other respiratory illness going on. Um, epiglottitis, on the other hand, though, is absolutely uh, an emergency. What, what can happen, the epiglottis is this flap of skin that protects the airway when you swallow. If it becomes inflamed, it can spasm. Sometimes when it spasms, it can actually occlude the airway. So one of the golden rules with suspected epiglottitis is never put anything in the mouth. Definitely don't use tongue depressors or the ringoscopes or anything like that to, to get a good view. Um, because actually you might just provoke that um, epiglottis into spasming. So you've only got to go to the back of the tongue and then you're sitting in that follicular space just in front of the um, just in front of the epiglottis, and that can definitely cause spasm. How can we spot the difference between the two? Sorry, this picture's gone a bit blurry. Um, but epiglottitis is going to make the child unwell. So toxic and unwell looking, you know, they're going to have high temperature. It's going to be fairly rapid onset. They're not going to be able to speak. But the real classic giveaway is that sitting forward drooling that we talked about a little bit earlier with patient positioning. That's something you're going to pick up on your on your kind of um, pediatric assessment triangle. Hopefully the child is, is sitting forward, not in a normal position. Um, jaw tends to fall forward because the the, the pain around the epiglottis, uh, the tongue tends to stick out. They tend to drool. They tend to dribble all over the place. So that's the thing to look out for: real high temperature, drooling, um, sore throats, not wanting to speak, looking unwell. You know, possibly some sepsis markers going on. We absolutely want to treat that as epiglottitis. Don't put anything in the mouth. Um, take them to hospital and and get them seen. Whereas croup, on the other hand, mild croup is, and there is a scoring system we're going to talk about in just a little while. Um, mild croup is is um, absolutely uh, absolutely fine to be treated in the community. Generally, that's that's normally GP referral or, or or gets better by itself, depending on what's going on. So, depending on who you're working with and your local policies, of course. Um, but moderate to severe croup may well go into hospital for that oral steroids just to settle them down. Um, but it's the seal bark cough gives away croup generally, whereas epiglottis they're, they're epiglottitis sorry they're generally not uh, they're not normally coughing. Hopefully that's made sense to you. Hopefully that's been useful, a little recap. Um, there are obviously a load of other uh, medical emergencies in children, but these are generally the ones that you need to be aware of um, in, in FREC 4 um, uh, as you work through some of the some of the assessment side of things there. Um, so let's get ready then for the, um, the proper quiz. So if you want to be in with a chance of getting 10% off a course, then let's join uh, Mentimeter now. Okay, so I'll push it forward to the quiz should say waiting for players there we go so if you're interested in joining the quiz get on to menti.com now 35907281 it's the same number what i will say it's probably a bit late for some of you that have joined in what i will say use your real names otherwise we we won't be able to kind of um link back to who's actually won the voucher at the end so try and use your real names or we're just gonna have to um just put in the chat or email us afterwards to say who you are so do join in. Anyone that wants 10% off a course, then join in. Uh, the way to win is answer correctly and answer as, as quickly as possible and average that over the five questions. It's nothing difficult, it's just answering quickly and correctly. So I'll just give you a minute for anyone else that wants to join in. Anyone else? Roll up, roll up. Oh, someone's left. They'd rather pay full price for their course. Fine, as soon as I start it, I don't think anyone else can join. So if you want to get in, do it now. Fine, we are back to 12. Okay, 
Right, so looking at your phones then, um, you don't get long to answer. Uh, quickest correct answer wins points, and then over the five questions, whoever wins, wins the prize. Okay, which of the following is used to screen for sepsis in children? Pre-hospital, I'll point out. Primary survey, POPs, News 2, or Pediatric Assessment Triangle, A, B, C, or D? See who got that right. Done. Nine of you got that right. Pediatric observation priority score is used by most trusts now for, for screening for sepsis. Uh, in hospital, they do use pews. Uh, news two is for adults only, and the primary survey isn't really going to tell you it's sepsis. Uh, you might just look at them and go, they're not very well. But sepsis is pops. Well done. Perfect. So I think I have to click there. I do, and it should tell us who's in the lead there. Excellent. We've got names. Holly, Holly won that one. Well done. Perfect. Holly takes the lead. Excellent. I think I need to click it again. There we go. Right, question two then, looking at your phones. How much oxygen would you give a child with suspected epiglottitis? None, 50%, 100% or a nasal at four litres a minute. Hands up. Excellent. Epiglottitis, so serious illness. So jail count guidance for oxygen indications for children are any child with serious illness and or injury, um, which epiglottitis would absolutely class as. So 100% oxygen. Congratulations to uh, six of you there. Excellent. Who won that one? Liam, Liam just uh, snuck the lead there, but I think Holly's holding on. Yeah, Holly's still in the lead. Well done. Next question. Looking at your phones. Which of the following suggests respiratory distress? Nasal flaring, tracheal tug, intercostal recession, or all of the above. Nice easy one there. All of the above, congratulations. Well done. That's why it's hard when you're trying to do it really quickly and you see, oh, that's the correct answer. And then you realize all of the above is there. <laughs> correct, Phil, read all the answers. Uh, Bonnie's doing well there. Matt won that one. Well done, Matt. And uh, oh no, Emma won just by, just by a couple of points there. Well done, very good. Holly's still in the lead. That's somebody very close. Okay, question four. True or false, it's often difficult to differentiate between respiratory and cardiac feather in children. That's easy one. Everyone has voted. It is true. Most of you are getting that right. It is really difficult to differentiate between respiratory and cardiac failure. Most of the time it is respiratory failure. So it's a respiratory cause for, for them being unwell. But actually it's, it's, it's very, very subtle differences um, between the two. So absolutely right, folks. So things like... Obviously, respiratory failure is more likely to be caused by a respiratory cause. So we're going to be looking for um, all the things that we talked about with increased work of breathing. Um, with circulatory failure, there's very little really that gives that away, but that's things like um, delayed capillary refill time and those changes to the skin that you're looking for in, in the C of your um, pediatric assessment triangle. Let's see who did well there. Well, it was, there's, there's some really consistent people here tonight. Everybody seems to be staying in roughly the same position. Holly, well done again, staying in the lead. So question five then, this is to uh, potentially for someone to take the lead. So question five of five, looking at your phones, which scoring systems used to grade a presentation of croup? How do we grade croup? Modified TELSIG, POPs, CRV65 or WELLS? Oh, 
Ooh, well done. Three of you got that right. How do we how do we grade croup? Croup is uh, the modified Tausig score, so from mild, moderate to severe, something to look up in jail calc. Okay, we don't use it so much anymore because it used to be that we we would only actually treat the patients outside of hospital if they had moderate to severe croup. So we used to score them all. We don't score them quite so much now because actually our guidance as paramedics, anyways, we can give the dexamethasone for mild croup too. So actually we give it regardless of their Tausig score. The only thing I would really look at for the Tarsic score is if I think they need to go in and I'm not really sure, then maybe we can grade them um, and see whether they're actually moderate or severe. Um, but good, well done. Three of you got that right. POPs is a pediatric observation priority score. That's really useful for sepsis or just generally being unwell. CRB 65 is for pneumonia. Wells is for DVTs and PEs, pulmonary embolus. So uh, let's see who did well there. Who's taken the lead? I think Holly held it. Well done, even though Holly didn't get any points on the last one, you you, uh, you held on to the lead by about 100 points. So very, very well done. So Holly, uh, is that you, Holly Stowe? Um, if you don't mind, just drop us an email to webinars at stctrainingsolutions.co.uk and we'll reply to you with your 10% your voucher, which you're free to use. As I say, we choose to use it on our fret for this week, this uh, this month. You'll also get the free book as well. So congratulations, Holly, and thank you to everyone for giving up their Wednesday evening. Um, I will take some questions in just a second, but just to say we'll be back next week. Um, Wednesday again, half past seven for episode 13, which is sepsis. Um, oh, Holly, a pediatric nurse. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, well deserved. You won. You won anyway. So very good. Um, so we will be back um, at um yes as i say 20 past uh, 20 past what am i on about half past seven on the 20th of october for sepsis we'll be talking about adults and children uh, within that i think that sums off the pediatric assessment and, and patient assessment sections nicely um if you've enjoyed tonight then please do leave us a review let me just um copy and paste something into the chat which will just give you all the links you need um there is a free certificate for this evening um, so if you'd like the certificate, um, there are all the links now in the chat. So um, quickly click on the bottom one is for your free certificate. The links above that are for um, leaving us a review if you've enjoyed tonight. I hope you have. Um, I hope it's been a, a useful refresher. Um, we'll be back next week if you want to come and join us then. Um, if you've missed any of tonight or you know someone else that might want to look at it, then um, do point them our way. It'll be on YouTube or, or on our uh, website um, within a couple of days. The slides will be available to download and as I say, do get your free um, certificate to say that you've been along tonight. And of course, we'd love to see you on, a, on an upcoming um, course or, or an event of some sort. So do, um, do stay in touch and we'll take questions if anyone has any. More than welcome. Thanks, Brian. And we'll see you on Sunday, don't we? Uh, so there's links there for reviews and there's a link there to get your uh, certificate, which everybody wants. You're all more than welcome. I'm glad tonight's been good. So Brian won last week's competition and is joining us this weekend for his ILS. So Holly, we hope to see you uh, on a course soon. Any questions, folks? I'm just going to pause the recording so I have less to edit later. <laughs>